Our journey starts with sand. Quartz sand. Quartz is pure silicon dioxide, and most of the Earth's crust is made out of it. Around 45% being oxygen, and nearly 30% silicon. That's why for us, humans, quartz resources are almost unlimited. That means that silicon resources are unlimited too. Fortunately, there have been invented industrial processes to separate this element from oxygen. We need something called an electric arc furnace, with big electrodes of graphite and some very high voltages. It's like an oven that uses lightnings to bake, or like in our case, to melt quartz at a high temperature of around 2000 degrees Celsius. The molten silicon dioxide reacts with the graphite to silicon and carbon monoxide. The resulting silicon is metallurgical grade silicon with a purity of 99.99%. You can make good alloys with it, but not reliable electronic components. To use silicon for a modern transistor, a purity of 99.99999 and 9% is needed. That means that if we have 1 billion particles, it is only allowed to have one particle that is not silicon. The solution is the Siemens process. At a temperature of approximately 300 degrees Celsius, the metallurgical grade silicon reacts with gaseous hydrogen chloride to trichlorosilane as well as pure hydrogen. Afterwards, the trichlorosilane is purified in some other distilling steps. Trichlorosilane is heated up until it becomes a gas. Then we let the gaseous trichlorosilane and additional hydrogen flow along a hot silicon rod. Trichlorosilane splits up into solid silicon on the hot rod and crystal growth takes place on different areas of the rod. The result is called polycrystalline silicon. That's how it looks in real. Hi. It means that the structure of the crystal is not perfect. The crystals that started to grow separately from one another now group up and build a bigger asymmetric crystal. The asymmetric lattice structure is a problem for moving electrons. They collide with the silicon atoms more often, that's less efficient and causes more heat dissipation. So what we need is just one single crystal. The solution is the Sokrolski process. Named after Polish scientist Jan Sokrolski, who accidentally invented the method while dipping his pen in molten tin instead of ink in 1916. Wow! The polycrystalline silicon from before is melt at a temperature of 1414 degrees Celsius. A little seed crystal is then dipped into the molten silicon. The seed crystal, some millimeters big, is the starting point for the perfect crystal growth of monocrystalline silicon. The growing crystal is slowly rotating and pulled out to ensure an even and controlled growth of the crystal. This process can last up to many days and at the end we will get a silicon ingot with a diameter of up to 30 cm and a purity of incredible 99.9999999%. It is possible to produce silicon ingots that are 300 or 400 kilograms heavy. After that, the silicon ingot is cut into thin slices called wafers. This damages the wafers a little bit, so they are polished with a solution of sodium hydroxide. 
At this point, we are ready to start building our first tiny transistor, the metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, in short, MOSFET. Nowadays, MOSFETs are made using the planar process. Planar means even surface. It's like playing with Lego bricks. You put level for level and you put layer on layer. The only difference is that you just need some billions of dollars to afford a semiconductor fabrication plant that has machines in it for manufacturing the nanometer small transistors. In the iPhone 11 Pro, 8.5 billion transistors, each with a size of 7 nanometers, can be found. And that is more than humans on this planet. Let's take the monocrystalline silicon from before and form the foundation of our transistor. For that we are going to p-dope the surface. We apply a gas on it that contains boron, a chemical element with three electrons in its outermost shell. It joins the crystal structure of the silicon which has four electrons in its valence shell. This causes an electron hole, basically the absence of a normal electron in a crystal lattice. An electron hole behaves like a slower moving, positively charged electron. Then we add a layer of silicon dioxide and apply a chemical called photoresist. The exposed areas can be etched away. Also, the photoresist can be removed in a step afterwards. Then we use ion guns to endope two particular parts of the surface, the conducting end channels. Endoping is similar to p-doping. Instead of a hole, it produces a free-moving electron that leaves the used phosphorus atom behind in the crystal lattice. Afterwards, a copper layer is added in order to connect the terminal voltages later on. This electronic thingy is called NMOS and has changed the way we humans live, work and see life. But it's not only the NMOS. There is a complementary part called PMOS. Together they are called CMOS, which stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. They form the majority of transistors and modern digital circuits, mainly because of low power consumption. The working principle is very easy to understand. In order to work, a supply voltage is applied, 5 volts and ground, which is equal to 0 volts. The terminals that are connected to the supply voltage are name, drain and source. Remember, NMOS and PMOS are the opposite of each other. If we apply a high voltage to the gate of the NMOS, it conducts electricity like a normal wire does. On the other hand, if we apply a high voltage to the gate of the PMOS, it will not conduct electricity. As a complementary part, it will only let electrons pass if the gate is connected to a low voltage. You see, 5 volts is high and 0 volts is low. These two states can be represented as 1 being high and 0 being low. Basically, you can control electron okay. flow in a MOSFET with only 1s huh? and zeros. This concept is key to understand more complex circuits. In future, transistors are going to become even smaller than the mentioned 7 nanometers. This development is referred to as Moore's Law, but it becomes a more and more difficult challenge for engineers to keep pace with that trend, because at a certain level, electrons just tunnel through the gate and make proper control of the electron flow impossible. But scientists and engineers will continue to work in order to make the impossible possible. I hope you've learned something new and had fun watching this video. It would be awesome if you would subscribe to Blitz for more cool science and engineering videos in the near future, because the world is full of fascinating things. 
Also, don't forget to click on the like button and activate bell notifications. Stay curious, until next time, see you!